It's now my pleasure to tell you a little bit about this morning's welcome address from our speaker, who is the renowned and fabulous um, mayor of Sacramento, Kevin Johnson. I had a chance to meet Mr. Johnson a couple months ago when he was on a listening tour uh, for education in California when they uh, were in San Diego. And I know he is passionate about what's going on, not only in education in his community, but what's happening in the state and what's happening nationally. Uh, Mayor Johnson is seen as a national leader in education reform. He strongly believes that in order to be a great city, you have to have great schools. And he's committed to identifying ways to strategically drive education reform. Uh, Kevin has an ambitious plan to ensure that all Sacramento students have the opportunity to attend excellent public schools, including he, he formed Stand Up for the Sacramento Schools, a 501c3 organization focused on accountability for results, excellent teachers and school leaders, and engaging communities with educational options and effective policy. Johnson's dedication to education began long before he uh, started his tenure as the mayor here in this great community. Upon retiring from the NBA 12 seasons with the Scenic Suns in 2000, he uh, returned to his Oak Park neighborhood in Sacramento. We always love it when the guys come home, you know? Uh, to serve as the CEO of St. Hope, a new profit community development organization he founded in 1989 to revitalize, revitalize inner city communities. To address a shortage in the quality of schools at Oak Park, uh, Kevin founded St. Hope Public Schools, a pre-K through 12th grade charter school system, including PS7 and of course the Sacramento Charter High School. PS7 has demonstrated a reverse achievement gap. What does that mean? Well, with socioeconomically disadvantaged black students, they are outperforming their affluent white peers with an API score, folks, of 913. <laughs> Sacramento Charter High School has demonstrated a not 100 and 96 point increase in API since 2003. 196 point increase, people. Come on. So will you please join me in welcoming to the stage our friend, our advocate, our mayor, Kevin Johnson. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have everybody here in Sacramento today. Um, we're honored to have so many people that are a part of the movement here in the city of Sacramento. I want to apologize for the rain in a second. Uh, let me first just thank Cameron for his remarks and his leadership. Uh, Jed Wallace, who's the, the boss in terms of this particular association for the great work they're doing, and all the organizers. Let's give them a quick round of applause. So in terms of apologizing for the rain, uh, I got married last Labor Day weekend. Thank you. September 3rd, 2011, I married an educator. And our ceremony started at 5 o'clock p.m. right outside of Knoxville, sunny skies. At 5.05, .05, the clouds started coming. <laughs> and at 5.10, it started pouring. And it rained on our wedding. And a few minutes after our wedding got done, people said, do you do not know that it's good luck when it rains on your wedding? I want you folks to know it is great luck for us <laughs> when it rains at a charter school conference for education reform. <laughs> So in all seriousness, my remarks are not long. Um, I'm just so proud to be here. You folks are doing the real work. Um, you know around this country there's a crisis going on in public education. Uh, if you think about California itself, 
You have 200,000 kids who do not graduate high school in California every year. You think about every 26 seconds, somebody's dropping out. If you look at our third or fourth grade reading scores in California, only 25% of our kids are reading at grade level in California. There are so many dismal statistics, but you folks in this room are doing something about it. You are showing that there's bright spots all over and that kids in every neighborhood can learn and do equally as well as other kids in other neighborhoods if they have access to good teachers and high quality education, which is really exciting. So in Sacramento, this is show you our challenge real briefly that the majority of our schools in California are not meeting the academic targets for California, the majority of our schools. But those that are doing well, oftentimes are the charter schools. They're the examples for the rest of the public schools that it can happen and it can be done. So you guys up and down the state are inspiring even people in Sacramento to continue the good work that all of you have started many, many years ago. So if you stick with the third grade theme in Sacramento, only 37% of all of our third graders are reading at grade level in Sacramento. That means 63% of kids in Sacramento are not reading at grade level. And you guys know this better than anybody. If kids are not reading at grade level by the time they leave third grade, 75% of those kids will never catch up. To make matters even worse, there is a correlation between kids who read that are literate and those who can't read with those who end up incarcerated. Folsom Prison, right up the street, 75% of the inmates are illiterate. A direct correlation between third grade reading scores and those who end up incarcerated. Three states in our union are building prisons based on third grade reading scores. Unacceptable. You know, and I know, there are so many bright spots up and down this state where kids and schools and communities are coming together to blow out everybody's expectation when they say kids can't learn and kids can't do well because of the neighborhoods that you grow up in. I grew up in a poor community in Sacramento called Oak Park. And I went off to college. I went to UC Berkeley on a basketball scholarship. Any Go Bears here? Any Cal? Go Bears? I got a basketball scholarship to Cal, and I remember being in a freshman English class, and everyone in the class was talking about this word euphemism. And I was the only kid in the class who did not know what euphemism meant. And all the other kids knew what euphemism, that word was. And I went back to my hotel room feeling pretty small, trying to figure out like what this word meant. So I tried to look it up in a dictionary. And you can't, euphemism doesn't, isn't spelled like it sounds. So that was a problem. Once I finally figured out a way to, you know, find a definition of the meeting, I think I probably called home. And I made a commitment at that point in time in my life that if I was ever successful enough, I was going to come back to my community and fight for kids in the neighborhood I grew up in to make sure that they had good schools and they knew what euphemism meant and they would go on to, they would go on to, And that they would go on to college and they wouldn't be the only kid from their neighborhood in college like I was. That was a very lonely experience. And I'm very proud to say that in 2002, 2003, we started a charter school called PS7. And that charter school, back when we started in 2003, essentially um, has went on to do amazing things. And I think they're going to be recognized a little later today. But one of the things that I was so proud of is this charter school has about 95% black and Latino kids at this school. 80% of the kids are part of the free and reduced lunch classification. And over the first couple years when we started the charter school, there was an achievement gap at this, this distance here. Here was the gap. After three or four years, we started closing the gap. Year five, there was no gap. And now, and now that school is doing so well, there's actually a reverse achievement gap in Sacramento when it comes to that school and those kids. And it truly is why we all do what we do. And those kids have proven, and I talked about third grade reading scores, that school, PS7, they have the highest proficiency rate 
in third grade than any school in Sacramento, regardless of what neighborhood it's in. They're at over 90% proficiency in third grade, those kids. So let me connect it to where we are today. You know, the California Charter Schools Association has done an incredible job of convening all of us, and we do it, you know, every year. It seems like it should be more, but we do it every year. Maybe it should be twice a year. I don't know if Jed Wallace can pull that off. But they do a great job of advocating for policies on behalf of all of us, we know. There's one I want to talk about really quickly, is just funding. You know, later today, we're going to have a rally over at the state capitol that we as charter school you know, operators, we want the same funding that everybody else gets. We want to prove that we can do our job giving a, a level playing field. And unfortunately, they expect us to do more with less. And we have found a way to still prove them wrong and do more than less, but we are not done advocating. So I'm asking everyone in here, rain or shine, if you get a chance today, to come over to the Capitol at 3.30 and, and join the rally. Make some noise if you plan on at least thinking about coming. So, so in closing, this is Black History Month, and I figure I'd end on a Black History Month lesson. If you're an African American, raise your hand really quickly. Okay, hands down. Raise your hand if you know somebody who's African American. <laughs> Thank you. We as African Americans, and we as people who know people who are African Americans, we love leap year because we get one extra day to talk about. <laughs> African-American history. So the, the story I want to tell ties into the simple remarks that I made earlier. That back in the days of slavery, there was something called a pit school. And a pit school was essentially a place where African-Americans would dig a hole in the back of where the plantation owners' houses were, where they had their little cabins, and they would dig a hole. And that hole would, would go down, you know, eight, ten feet. And at that particular time, African Americans weren't allowed to congregate together unless they were out in the field or in churches. It was illegal to just congregate. We couldn't do that. That's why if you've ever been to a black church, um, we go to church all day because it was the only place that back in the day that we can congregate. So that was part of our tradition. But that community was not allowed to read. We weren't taught to read at that particular time, but there were a few people who could read. So what they would do is they would borrow a Bible from church. I don't know if they stole it, but they would borrow a Bible from church. <laughs> and at the end of the night, when the plantain, plantation owners went to sleep, they would go to the bottom of the hole with a candle, and they would take a young person down to the bottom of the hole. And then somebody would cover up the top with leaves, and they would teach the next generation of young people how to read. And think about that commitment today. Think about if those adults would have gotten caught, they would have risked being lynched, being beaten. They even risk getting a limb cut off. And maybe even worse, they would risk being separated from their families. But that was the commitment and the sacrifice that those folks were willing to make on behalf of the next generation when it comes to education. You people in the room, you're more than teachers and principals and school operators. And you guys are the movement. You're the ones who are proven to our country that this notion of the civil rights, you hear this all the time, is education the civil rights issue of our time? We all say yes. But you know what? It's, it's more than just saying yes. You have to be willing to sacrifice and fight and risk something. You're going to lose some friends and everyone's not going to be happy. It's okay to rock the boat. It's okay to ruffle some feathers. That's what you folks are doing in this, mo in this movement. So to complete my story of the Pitt School, Rosa Parks, you guys remember Rosa Parks? She was a part of the Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Movement was not just African Americans. It was all of us. It was everybody in this room. That's why I said if you know somebody, then you're guilty. We claim in you as our black brothers and sisters. <laughs> you are guilty. You are all part of this movement. So the notion here of us saying that the civil rights movement of the 21st century is going to be education 
That means we're going to stand together in unison. We're going to fight on behalf of every child to make sure they have access to good schools. We're not going to let anybody tell us different that because of the color of your skin or the zip code that you live in, that your educational in life is determined by that. No, these kids can rise above it. That's what PS7 and many of you are doing up and down this country. Harriet Tubman. Raise your hand if you heard of Harriet Tubman, Underground Rail Yard. Harriet Tubman, she made these treks from the United States to Canada to free slaves. You guys have all heard the story, the Underground Railroad. She ended up saving 300 people with all of her treks. And at the end of the day, people interviewed her after all these years, and they said, Harriet, how do you feel about all the success that you've had? And she said, I have mixed emotions. And the person interviewing her said, how could you have a mixed emotion? She said, because I saved 300 people, but I could have saved thousands more had they had only known that they were slaves. We must educate our children. The day and the year that Harriet Tubman dies is the same year that Rosa Parks is, bo is born. A torch is passed. What we are doing now, our fight is to create an environment where that we pass the torch to young people in Sacramento, in the Bay Area, in San Diego, up and down the state, because that is our future. And you guys are doing your part, and I'm honored to be a part of the movement. God bless you, and enjoy the conference. If you are what you say you are, a superstar, then how